a lot of you guys are mobile content developers. I got a little music on, all right? So I spent 20 years talking about what you guys were talking about right now, building content, mobile app, media app, gaming apps. Over a billion consumers have used my products, uh, over a billion and a half dollars of shareholder creation. And about a year ago, uh, I decided to go into hardware. Oh, I'm not even, yeah, sorry, I'm not on my deck. Hey, the deck is, you know. Who likes booze? So we can start without the deck, but about a year ago, I decided to go into a space that was completely different. I'm an extreme sport athlete. I'm outdoors all the time. I'm cycling, running, hiking. Uh, and I'd spent a bunch of time looking at a bunch of products out there that seemed fairly irrational to me, like Away, uh, Allbirds. Uh, and ultimately, there was something very interesting about all these consumer package companies, these um, you know, textile companies, these hardware companies like Peloton, um, and I'm not going to go into their financials, uh, but that were building something that moved past and beyond selling you technology, right? You're all on your phone and your laptops right now. You're not using 90% of that technology, but you are having an experience through the technology. You have a Mac, you have a Samsung, you're associating, you're a part of something. When you wear Allbirds, you're wearing Allbirds for more than just that they're comfortable. When you're buying, you know, um, whatever that non-meat meat company is, it's kind of because you're woke. Like, it's, it's the thing to be doing right now. It speaks to you, it speaks about you, it says something about you to whoever's looking at you, eating that, buying that, being a part of that movement. And so, what you come to realize over time and what I come to realize building uh, products that have reached over a billion consumers, which is a fair amount, uh, across gaming, which this industry and this you know, uh, event revolves around a lot. Uh, we built Draw Something, which one of those biggest phenomenons in the history of mobile. Um, you know, we built uh, Curse, which was one of the biggest MMO gaming destinations in the world that sold to Twitch. Um, we just recently, I built PixArt, which is you know, 700 million plus users of, of people who are creating content um, around the world. Um, so I spent a lot of time building communities and, and building products that were about not the technology or the software, but the impact that you were having to people's experiences and the value creation of that impact and the, the value in principle to how you can thus grow through your brand and your community and not just because you're creating tech through VC capital. So I think one of the things that's most important, and I'm hopefully gonna go through the right little buttons there. Which one is it? Uh, am I pushing the enter button? The arrow down, or sideways, nope. Let me see. Nope. Um, I'll tell you what, what was interesting to me when I started to move and pivot into hardware uh, and into this idea that there was an opportunity in the market around a particular industry for me um, is that a lot of the brands that were being very successful, highly capitalized, and having a major market impact that a lot of you guys in the Valley are using, it wasn't just about whether or not it was significantly better or more impactful than a lot of other products. Uh, it was whether or not you guys felt that you were a part of something, that you belonged to something, that you were a part of telling a story, that you could relate and associate to that story. Uh, and so when you guys are at the airport with your away suitcase, um, it speaks to who you are. Somehow you've put yourself into a certain ecosystem of people. It's like writing angel investors on your LinkedIn. Maybe you've spent five grand angel investing somewhere, but suddenly you've status quo yourself into a certain category of people. Um, when you buy your Peloton, right? It's a really hardcore, intense community of very dedicated people, high income people. But what they went on to sell is the experience, the community, the coaching, uh, the coaches, the content. They weren't selling you, hey, this is why you should spend $2,000 on a bike. They were selling you the impact that the bike was gonna have as it relates to your experience when you followed certain coaches, when you were a part of a community, when you showed up every day for that class. Soul Cycle, right, was very good at creating that. Um, 
So why am I the guy to talk about this, even though there's you know, multi-billion dollar companies out there? Uh, first of all, because most of those multi-billion dollar hardware companies are failing, um, and that there's another economical reasons behind that. But I built a hardware company with two SKUs and a mobile app in under a year, and under $800,000, launched it, and have built a community around it, and I'm selling a product that has high engagement velocity to two plus times a week. Now, it hasn't been done yet in the history of the Valley. The average fundraising round is around three to four million dollars, and it takes two to three years to release a hardware product, All right? But my principle when I decided to launch this company wasn't whether or not I was gonna build better tech than Sonos or Apple. I mean, that's, that's just a mute point. Tech is commodity. It was about whether or not as in every other product that we built at my past companies, which were software, we could create a community and a sense of presence and purpose and re-engagement to the people who were gonna use that product and have them have an emotional connection to that, which would then have them use it, talk about it, and become brand ambassadors. And all that then leads into your CAC, your LTV, your economics of your model, and your fundraising. So my thesis and my theory was, well, you know, there's earbuds and AirPods out there, uh, and there's also 16,000 accidents a year of people using those in urban environments. There's over 50,000 accidents a year of people using their phones while active and mobile outdoors. And there's nobody solving the problem of what is it that you do when you're running, cycling, hiking, mountain biking? What is it that you can use to access essential technologies and not put your life at risk and not feel like you're losing the moment or being taken away? And so I created Robin. Um, it was simply about creating hands-free and headless audio communication camera products. It was simple. There's 150 million Americans out there who are active week, you know, on a yearly basis, 55 million of them twice a week. 55 million runners, 50 million cyclists. And their options when they're out there to listen to motivational content, to music, to communicating with people they're peloton running with or cycling with or running with, shit. Earbuds, headphones. If you're a woman running out there right now, 80% of you have been sexually harassed or harassed while running. Only 50% of women out there are wearing earbuds because of their experience. Now, if you're a guy out there running, your sense of experience and safety is, I don't wanna get run over. But fuck it, I'll take the risk because I'm a guy and maybe a car will come around, whatever, I'll figure it out, right? That's where the rationality of women and men are very different, right? We did 200 live usability tests with our product and over 20 prototypes in six months. Every two weeks we had a new prototype and we went to market and we segmented use cases in live environments and we A-B tested and we got surveys and we got live camera feedback and we solved problems that were real to people. And around that we decided to craft a narrative and a story to what it is that we were Robin and what Robin was gonna accomplish. And if you look at all the companies that you guys have bought products from, if you look at the companies that stay around for a long term, think about Apple in the 80s and the 90s. First, when Steve Jobs was there, uh, and they had that awesome 80s campaign with the woman throwing the hammer across that window. And, and then when he came back, when they fucked up Apple, and he launched a new campaign uh, where he had Picasso and all those people. And, because he, he said it. Like, you have to sell a marketing experience. You have, the marketing sells the purpose and value of your experience of your product. You can't go out there and just sell another computer. Look, Dell used to own the computer market. Well, this is the last time anybody talked about Dell, right? Commoditization is technology. Experiences and emotions are not commoditizable. Now, these brands out there, Alberts, I mean, whatever, you know, like, but what they did was amazing, right? They got a movement around this idea that like you can have shoes that, you know, come from sheep and they're healthy, you know, it's better for the environment and it's nicer for you to wear and they're comfortable and you're a part of something. Um, you know, Peloton's done an amazing job. And by the way, until, until recently, other than Nike, all these brands are community bottoms up driven brands, right? Peloton decided not to do a deal with Kevin Hart because they did not want a singular figure to reflect and represent the community that Peloton was about. Now, that's a pretty bold decision to make, but Peloton has grown itself because everybody who gets on it gets addicted to it for various reasons, which goes back to gamifications of, of, of gaming and all sorts of stuff, gambling and all that stuff. But ultimately you got on the Peloton because you joined a group and you had your coach and you felt like you could relate and there was somebody there to support you and the content was awesome and you decided that you were gonna grind down that 40 minutes a day every day or every two days and that you felt like there was a purpose to that and you were a part of that, that movement the same way SoulCycle started that in, in gyms, in, 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 indoors, right? If you, if you went to New York or other places in SoulCycle, you'd see people waiting in line to get in there like fucking crazy fanatics, 
right? Like they had their trainer coach there. One of those coaches happens to be a Robin user uh, and she produces content with us. But like, it, it, it's like a cult, right? Is Apple a cult? No, well, you guys who are using Apple, you're pretty hardcore about it. Like you're not going to Samsung anytime soon. Like Apple would really need to fuck up big time for you to suddenly decide like, I'm going to be a Samsung guy. No, that's why you're buying the AirPods and the watch that you don't need. They're, they're, they're moving up the food chain of the sense of value creation, but it's really about you know, the experience and the brand they're driving off of you belonging to that brand and associating with it and what it says about you to your ecosystem, to your environment, to the people around you. So when you look at these brands, almost all of those were built off of a sense of brand uh, experience, of brand identity, your relatability to that brand identity, your, your desire to be participating in that, how it made you, you know, be inspired, the value systems that they had behind it. I mean, a lot of people know Steve Jobs is an asshole. Does it deter you from what the brand messaging and the brand value of what Apple is to you means? No. Because holistically, what Apple did in the industry and who it was fighting against, Microsoft, right, and what it stood for, right? Apple, there's a great speech by Steve Jobs about, you know, the, the, the text fonts and how he learned that stuff in college. And he was like, we're going to have better text fonts than Apple ever will. And that matters to people. And you know what? It actually did. You felt differently about it. When we created Pixar, Okay, it was a co-founder in Armenia, a little engineering team, and he's like, we're gonna empower a billion people to be creators. Instagram was coming around, and everybody was posting photos about their dogs and their poop and their eating and whatever else, and it was all about trying to get followers, and he's like, no, we're, we're gonna empower people to be creators, right? And ultimately, you know, we used 700 million users later on our way to a billion, made people feel like they could be a creators, like they could participate with other creators, they could learn from other creators, that they could be a part of a community that was healthy where they could learn something, share with somebody, and then ultimately use that content as well. So we create human experiences, community, belonging, right? If you're a Harley guy, right, you, you're, you're a part of a tribe, right? Like the sports industry is tremendous at doing this, right? I mean, look how worked up people get about being Real Madrid versus somebody else, where you're a Yankee versus something else. I mean, it's completely irrational. Like, I mean, who gives a shit in the end, right? But like, but it's deep inside of you. you you're, you're like, you're a tribe. You belong to something. It's a human DNA nature of desire that we have. Same with religion. Same with, you know, legacy of where you're born, et cetera, et cetera. So these brands have done an amazing job at recreating that. And what's really important um, is that the, it doesn't matter where you are in, in your stage of the business. It, it's something that you have to start out of the gate. You have to start out of the gate thinking about what's my mission statement? What do we stand for? Why am I building this company? Of course, you're solving a friction issue. Of course, you hopefully you know, have viable economics and there's a large enough market. Um, but you have to think about your brand from day one. You have to think about what it will mean to people, why people will use it, why people want to talk about it, what kind of high value impact it will have. And by the way, is any of this any different from any app business, any software business that you're creating? Absolutely not. There's a myth about a decade ago that somehow hardware was its own little category over there that had nothing to do with software and there's a different business environment, different business cycle, different capital expenditures. Like, like none of these two things were relatable on a DNA culture standpoint. That's not true at all. It's not true in how the industry works today and how you manufacture today uh, and how products get distributed to market and how you acquire customers uh, and how people socialize content. It was true a decade ago, it's no longer true. So, you, you know, when I decided to go to the VCs early on and they're like, why aren't you doing another software company? I'm like, I wanna do hardware. They're like, that's shit. That, that we, 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 don't, we don't do hardware anymore. And that was because 2010, 2015, they invested in a lot of hardware companies, Fitbits in the world, they didn't have consumer data. They didn't have distribution channel. They didn't know anything about their users. They didn't know the engagement of the product, right? They didn't control the brand messaging because they were only doing Best Buy, right? So they didn't have, you know, they thought that, you know, margins were derived off of the, 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 the scalability of how many, you know, batteries you ordered. Well, batteries, a dollar, under, under, I mean, batteries are like the cheapest thing you could ever buy on any electronic product these days. It's under a dollar. So whatever electronics you're buying, just know that the battery is one of the cheapest things that is in that, in that product, right? So commodization of all these electronics out there makes producing much cheaper, much more efficient. So why are you going to spend your whole time trying to solve for the economics of a business when that's already been solved for for you? What you need to solve for is whether or not you're creating enough value for the consumer and your storytelling and your access and your targeting actually gets to the consumer that you need to start adopting early. Think about World of Warcraft. Think about Fortnite. Right? Products that you guys may be more kind of attuned with and accustomed with right now, right? It's all core users that become, you know, propaganda marketing machines, right? They're the original adopters, are your ambassadors, 
right? Soul cycles, the coaches become social influencers, right? So it's not that different. And the, the day of mediation and proliferation of content and the day where your consumers are your marketers and the day where your entire life cycle matters, right? What do we have something else than just more buying users these days? We have life cycles, push notification, re-engagements, we have emails because that's the life cycle of a user. The app store matters. When they download the app, what's the first onboarding experience matters. Like, it's a life cycle pro process where at each touch point you need to communicate and build a relationship. And that's why even in the gaming industry, in the SaaS industry, in the software industry, these life cycles and the tools in between all of them, which many of you are here learning about or thinking about using, are impacting the way you're gonna be building your product or whether or not you're retaining your user or how you'll build your brand. And it's the same for hardware because ultimately, we have even more variables. We have packaging, we have the website, we have the manufacturers, we have the social influencers, we gotta produce contents, we gotta produce ads, we gotta ship the, the product, we gotta, you know, there's product chip backs, there's, you know, technical issues, we gotta manufacture them before we ship them. So there's much more ambiguity and complexity in fulfilling a great brand. And so great consumer brands are a lot harder than it seems to build because ultimately, when's the last time you thought about Nike as it related to what the shoe did for you? Nike doesn't sell the technology of the shoe. It sells you an aspirational, um, you know, I want to say lifestyle. There's always a saying that Nike was always about the, 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 the pro, I mean, this is from um, somebody who was very high up at Adidas who ran multiple divisions who said, we're the functional value creation. Nike's the getting you laid product. And, and he made it that simple. He's like, and if Robin isn't getting somebody laid or creating high value functional output that makes them better so that they can get laid, it's not a good product. And he simplified it that much at the college and high school level to how Nike and Adidas competed in that market. He's like, listen, the quarterback, if he's wearing Under Armour shoes, he, 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 nobody's coming up to him. And he classified these brands simplistically by human behavior and the purpose of what the brand represented externally to you. And thus what it had to do for you in that environment. So a lot of these brands that you, know, you come about, you, 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 know, you have to make sure people remember the name of your brand. You have to make sure they remember the experience the first time they come on. They have to feel an emotional attachment to it. They have to feel emotional attachment, which then makes them excited about it. They want to talk about it. Um, they have to learn behavior around adopting a product. Every time you get a new iPhone, there's like a little, little new gimmick, right? There's a little friction. But that friction becomes learned behavior, and that mechanics then becomes pattern, right? But all the greatest games out there have friction, just enough that you learn mechanics but not too much that it's impossible for you to solve and then you get frustrated and you, and, and you drop off, right? So all products out there that actually are very successful have friction. Now, the most important thing around UX and UI accordingly, whether it's a software product, a SaaS product, whatever it is, is that you create friction that's related to quick learning behavior that become patterns. That's why gambling games were so, you know, were, were so f successful, right? It's like, you do this, but the outcome's always different, and that's really exciting. But it's, all you had to learn to do was this, right? Putting down the machine, and then the little things are spinning, you're like, wow, right? And so gaming was very much about that. You have to create products and experiences where people want to talk about you. If nobody's talking about your product, your product cannot grow. I don't care how much marketing you're putting out there, right? So building the community, uh, building the trust brand factor is really critical to whether or not you're going to be successful, and that's across all of these products. And that's why, you know, and... Technically, um, I'm speaking at this conference today, even though there's no real wearable component to the conference, is because after 20 years of building software companies, I managed to replicate what is making software companies successful today in media and content and gaming into the hardware environment. Because when you look at the most successful hardware companies, they're actually re replicating those same behaviors. Um, <laughs> you got to do the work, right? You got to build a product for a market that's there. You got to read about who your consumers can be. Uh, you got to get the data about these consumers. Um, you know, you got to talk about who failed and succeeded and why. For example, when I launched my hardware company, immediately I went to the VCs. I'm like, introduce me to your five failed startups. I don't, I don't care about the guy who succeeded. As a guy who sold multiple startups, I know what goes into that. That guy is not going to teach me anything. The guy who missed out on a $300 million opportunity because he mismanaged cash flows or he overpaid on, on his batteries and, and subscription and whatever that may be, or he didn't have data or he didn't have a mobile app to re-engage his customers. I want to understand how I, with 20 or $30 million, the guy missed out on his $300 million output, right? That you learn from. So you got to get out there and not think that you're learning from the best, but get into the trenches of why it is, whether it's economical, whether it's timing, whether it's managerial, that people failed because you're risk managing. Whoever's an entrepreneur here, your primary goal is to get on base so that at some point you score. 
there is no home run reality. There is just getting on base and scoring. To do that, you have to risk mitigate and you have to understand what you're working towards. So the more information you have to why people didn't get on second base or third base or didn't get home, the better off you are in understanding what it is that you're going to be mitigating for and what you solve for uh, as a startup. There is no success without, um, you know, without solving friction at scale. You know, yeah, there's like little, you know, World of Warcraft when it started was not an industry. When they got to 10 million plus subscribers a month, they started doing TV commercials. You knew they had gotten to a saturation point where they thought they'd need to, you know, to be mass market, right? And that was around 2006 or seven. That was seven years after they launched. Um, but the, everything has to be at scale, right? Because you'll never reach that scale, right? It's like if you say, well, I want to be worth 10 million one day, you're lucky if you feel worth 5 million one day. Because the principles are such that it will never be what it is that you aspire to. And the one percentile or sub one percentile of the Facebooks of the world, I mean, sure, you can tell yourself that you're that person, or you can figure out how to actually get somewhere and be successful without aspiring to be Zuckerberg. So you got to have a high impact at, on, on large scale. You have to have repeat engagement. Same for hardware or any product. You cannot have a once a month engagement and think that you're building longevity and LTV and, and, and repeat engagement and that you can use your customer as a brand ambassador and that you're creating high value. You're just not. You're just not. And by the way, that ties into your economics and ties into your cost of acquisition and ties into your funding. Right? If you go to a VC team and be like, yeah, we think our you know, users will probably engage with the app once a month. Like, they'll look at you and be like, that, that, that's nice. That, that's nice. Right? Okay, well, on to the next guy who says that he thinks he's got a five times a week engagement value. Right? So, Engagement velocity is really critical across all products. Like, I mean, how many times are you using your phone today? Three or 400 times a day, 400 times a day, something like that, right? So you just overpaid $1,000 for a product that you only use 10% of, but you're using three or 400 times a day. You're, you're, you're consciously, subconsciously, you don't even care that you just overpaid for a product that you don't really use, right? Because you're, what it is that you're using and how much of it you're using it is creating huge amounts of value for you. So it's really important to understand that like, you got to create that value and that velocity of repeat value has to happen often. Um, you have to have great UX because ultimately you're onboarding people, people's funnel experiences are everything to drop off. Um, you got to get your product out there. Like I said, 200 live usability tested and 20 plus prototypes under six months. The only way we learned what we learned and we did what we did to build a product that people are buying and enjoy using is because we threw ourselves out there. Right? In an agile environment, just like you can code, people are like, oh, hardware, it's not agile. You, you can't get you know, packaged goods and sneakers and t-shirts. You, you know, it takes too long to manufacture, whatever this and that. No, you create an agile environment in your R&D process and with the factories you know, so that you can get product out there and you can get real user feedback of whether or not you're improving your thesis. Are you meeting your thesis? Right? Is it what it is that you're trying to achieve actually taking place when people are using it? Are you learning something that's helpful? Are you realizing that the straps were uncomfortable or it weighs too much or, you know, the buttons are hard to use? Oh, so again, all these things go back to that. What I would say is don't do this. And I would say this for every startup. Don't waste too much money to spend all this time in R&D and hacking and getting all geeky as an engineer. Like two years from now, the market's moved on from you. Nobody gives a shit about how complicated your hard tech is. And nobody cares about how complicated your game is or how improved your AI or R, you know, nobody cares. The consumer does not care. That's your end goal, right? The consumer. Now, maybe it gets the VC excited. Oh, that's really new tech in AR. That's really, that's really, you know, mirror. If you think about mirror, you know, the thing on the wall, they're like, oh, I mean, they could have doctors in there. They're like, yeah, $3,000 for one woman every 25,000 household who's going to decide to be in front of a, a mirror and then spend $3,000 a month moving up and down in your yoga versus the $100 a month she can pay for the gym. Like, it's all aspirational, but it's not real. Right? So don't overraise to then just spend time building tech that nobody wants to use that you've overpriced and you don't know whether or not people actually have interest in. A lot of hardware companies failed because they took too much money and spent their entire time hiring engineers, solving really complicated problems with no consumer at the end of it. Okay? Now, you need money. Every business needs money. And more is more than less. Let me tell you, because when you are successful and you do not have enough money, or when you're less than successful and you do not have enough money, it's already too late to raise money, right? So you want to raise money, but you're much better off allocating some of that money to establishing what are criteria of growth off of a product that you built in an agile environment that you have high levels of confidence, not that it's the best product in the world, but that people really love using it. When I built Robin, I said 80-20. Technology, 80-20. Good technology, great experiences. Because nobody cares what's in this box. 
when they walk outside and they use it, the fact that they felt safe, that they got their calls on the go from the wife, that uh, they had their LED lights in the back and it was raining and they felt like it was fine to be running outside, like they don't care. What they cared is whether or not they paid for something that creates high value and that they want to use again multiple times in a row. So nobody cares about the tech. That's just the mentality of the VC Valley. There's like, oh, look at my air filter. It cost $3,000 and they spent $10 million over the past three years to build and it's in my conference room, my VC. And I'm always like, yeah, that's, that's great. I'm always like, really? This is, this is what you get LP money for? Well, yeah, it is actually. So understand the cost efficiencies, understand live prototype testing, focus on life cycle user engagement, None of these things are different from what you should be doing today for your game company, for your software company. It's all the same cycles. Have capital for marketing. Make sure that you raise capital for marketing because, you know, you got to get a product out there. There's three, three million apps out there. So again, we go back to hardware, mobile apps. It's the same. You know, when somebody's like, oh, you know, we only had a million installs in the past month. I mean, listen, that's great. But like, even at Pixar today, organically, we're still getting 10 million installs a month, seven years later. So like, you're 10x below us and you're in your high growth velocity stage. So like you need money, right? And if you don't have enough scalability, you don't get product exposure, you don't get enough data, you don't get enough KPIs, you don't get enough velocity, you don't have brand presence, you don't have PR, right? You're not creating an environment where people want to associate and relate to. So capital matters, filing patent matters because you're creating a foundational business that's important to you. Um, market segmentation, seed the market early, engage, engage, engage your users. I had a CS person, customer service person, before we even went live. We were seeding the market in advance, getting the product out there, prototypes of them, you know, 50 of them, right? Runners, cyclists, fitness people, right? And then we asked them questions. We had them do little videos, surveys, right? But then they started liking the product and they cared the fact that we cared about what they had to say. And then we use those as tutorials, as advertorials, as reviews, as surveys. And I use that for investors. And investors are like, oh shit, like people really like this product and it's not even live yet, right? So what you're investing into who's purchasing your product comes back moving forward. You're investing it forward, basically. You're paying it now, it comes back forward. Really important. Um, customer support is critical, velocity is critical. Um, and you gotta get to market, increase virality because ultimately like all products need virality. So all your use cases of products have to have a purpose and a reason for somebody to talk about it to somebody else. One of the biggest challenges at Pixar that we had is that because we were photo editing at first, um, people just had their own individual experience but didn't really have a purpose to tell somebody else that they had created this awesome edit with Pixar. Um, but over time, as people cared more about what their content was on, other on third party channels like YouTube, like Instagram, like TikTok, then the, you know, people were like, oh, wow, where'd you make this? Oh, wow, how did you make that? And then people were like, oh, you know, bizarrely enough, without spending any media dollars and ad dollars, we went to 600 million users organically because ultimately people actually did care about what it is that they were posting and how that reflected on them. And people want to learn. And so teaching people is an important part of the process, right? You're not focusing on tech. You're focusing on experience and delivering value, right? And your mobile product is the same. What high impact value are you having? What repeat engagement are you having? What retention does that create? What brand trust are you creating through PR? through, uh, you know, an endorsement, you know, like, listen, these things take capital. So when you raise that $3 million for your company, I wouldn't be like, yo, let's just hire all these crazy engineers. They're going to build this amazing tech. I'd be like, you know what? Like whatever stages that we're at and getting on base, it has to be fundamentally viable to how we're building a company, how we're building our brand, how we're building our brand trust. So you have to trickle in things along the way because you can't wait six months in to be like, I think this is good and then go to a PR and then you really have no user stories. Nobody's ever heard of you. You really don't have anything to speak about. You don't really have a round that nobody cares about to put on TechCrunch because it's a clickbait environment these days. So like you, you got to be able to think about how you commit to, you know, putting your brand, putting your messaging to the market. We had 250 plus micro influencers for free before we went live by seeding the product and they posted content. Now, Instagram today is harder than it used to be because with the stories, the content is in and is out. So you gotta be there kind of scrolling everywhere to try to capture that content and repost it. But we invested in content, we invested in storytelling, we invested in the impact that we we're having on women running. And you gotta find a purpose, you gotta find a mission statement, right? That new meat company that's not meat. Like, ah, oh, is it about being organic? Is it about health? Is it about saving the world? Whatever, like people are just getting on that bandwagon. I haven't had one yet, so I'm not gonna speak to whether or not it's good. Uh, I, I go cattle ranching on a natural grass-fed, you know, Angus beef ranch which is pretty good for the environment, at least better than feedlots. But like, 
people want to be a part of things that have meaning and purpose. So you got it through that list, right? Who's buying your product? What are your social channels? You got to be on social. You got to be on social. You got to be on social. You know, founders have to tell stories. People follow founders. PR is about founders. Um, PR and so mission statement, founder stories, you know, market impact, user stories. That's what sells your company on funding. That's what sells your company on an everyday basis. Why is it that, you know, all these companies right now, if you're away, if you're Peloton, whatever, like it's all the users speaking about their experiences, right? That's what it is. And you're like, oh, I want that experience. Like, oh, I can relate to that experience. You know, it seems irrational at a billion dollars for away. And I don't want to make a public statement to whether or not, you know, they're like, you know, um, the uh, mattress company, uh, you know, is going to go under. But like the, the point is that at certain stages to get to that stage, like a way they like Peloton did, forget the economics of the business at scale, they use their consumers and the passion of their consumers and the impact that they had on consumers to feed social and to create that brand presence. You know who's great at doing that? Trump. It's not even about politics. I'm not talking politics here. I'm talking about marketing. I'm talking about brand presence, minor thought, you know, PR presence, the idea that people believe in is what it is that you're selling, repeating the story, right? You can say whatever you want, the policies, and, and obviously, being that we're in San Francisco, they're atrocious, uh, and they are, and he's atrocious. That aside, you cannot take away the, the brilliance of the marketing of the man, right? However despicable, whatever it is that it is he's saying or not, whatever you believe in, what do you think makes a successful company successful? What do you think Tesla is successful? What do you think Apple was successful? Look at how they brought their products to market. It's not very different. So it's about applying that to a bit of good, better good, but you know, ultimately, the reason why I was speaking today is yeah, I did something that nobody could do in the Valley, but it wasn't just about the fact that I got SKUs to market, mobile app to market, and I was solving a big problem and saving lives. It was the fact that I realized when I did hardware that actually it was very, similar to doing media, to doing gaming, to doing any other platform, because it was about human relationship, human experiences, and whether or not people are gonna love using your product, and how that could derive itself into a business. We have great unit economics, right? So I solve for the unit economics, four times you know, unit to retail. It's the same that you need to be doing in your own business, right? What's your CAC? Like how much does it cost to acquire a user? What's that cost? Was that user worth when it comes to single purchase, so, you know, multiple purchase, or the virality or the K factor of that user? It's all the same. But what you cannot win without, regardless of the economics of the model, is a mission statement and a brand purpose. And having people believe in that, wanting to be a part of that, and participating in that, and becoming your K factor. And if everybody here in this room used a Robin, you could tell 10 people about why you run with it, why you cycle with it, how it saved your life once, and that 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 ends up having an acquisition funnel of 100,000 customers for every 1,000 customers you buy. And no product is different. If your product is entirely dependent on every single user acquisition on a one-to-one -one basis, it's not possible for you to scale a large-scale company that's going to be economically efficient. That's, that's all I had. I'm already over time. I don't even know if I have time for questions, but I'm happy to answer anything anybody had.